So our next speaker will be uh, Professor Tom Goldenstein from University of Maryland. So uh, Tom, if okay, I'm Tom. I'm giving you the co-host, sure. and now you should be able to share your sli uh, sli slides. Okay. All right. Let's All right. So just one minute for me to give you a very brief introduction. So we are uh, Professor Tom Goldenstein is a associate professor of computer science to uh, from University of Maryland. So he has a very, very broad research interest in the intersection of machine learning, signal processing and optimization, computer vision, signal processing and uh, more, I guess. So he got his PhD from UCLA and then did a postdoc with Rice and uh, uh, Rice and Stanford University. He has a many works uh, that I'm personally very interested in. Uh, so starting from the Brigham splitting algorithm to the recent adversary training and the quantized networks the trainability. So without further ado, Tom, please take it over from me. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Atlas. Um, all right, I'm gonna talk about a range of different things we're doing in my lab that are all sort of, um, sort of related to theory, but I guess a little bit different. I call this talk Seeking High Dimensionality in Neural Nets because some of the things I'll talk about actually involve uh, the benefits of high dimensionality, even some of the things I'll we'll talk about are also related to the benefits of low dimensionality. By the way, Tom, yep. by the way, Tom, I think the title to be shorter than the one you give us on the web page. I thought you have the longest yeah. title oh, among think, all the it talks. Probably had a few more words than a title <laughs> could have, so I chopped it off. Oh, that's great. Uh, compressed sensing, right? We get better to take a, an understanding of the title, and it's more efficient. So, all right. Um, Okay, so I'll say a few things about um, my personal goals and what I'm interested in in my lab. But you know, one of the things that I'm interested in my lab is uh, the science of deep learning. Uh, when I say the science of deep learning, I mean that you, you formulate a hypothesis and then you do an experiment to see whether that hypothesis is true. Um, and I have this idea that you know, experimental discovery is gonna be an important way to, to uh, unveil some of the important principles uh, that underlie machine learning. So I think that it's a good way to discover uh, what we should be proving. Uh, and I also think that it's important to do in view of validation of mathematical theories. So if you have a mathematical theory, you know, determine whether or not, uh, you know, the principles that the theory is relying on really say anything about the, the underlying uh, phenomenon that you're trying to study. Um, and I think that experiments and science in general are, are, are sort of missing from deep learning. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, fields like, um, relativity, quantum mechanics, all of these sorts of things that really began with, with experimental sciences. And then the theorists really went to work to try to uh, understand and predict the behaviors that were being uh, um, you know, uh, discovered in, in, in practice. And I think that in, in deep learning, we have this tendency, at least when we study the foundations of deep learning, to think that everything has to be theoretical, right? Everything has to be sort of codified as, as a rigorous theorem. Uh, but I think that to get really far in this space, we're gonna do a little bit more experimental science to really understand, you know, uh, like during, during John Wright's talk today, he was saying we don't quite understand what properties are important for images, for example, right? We might need to know some things about the sort of properties that, that are, are playing important roles empirically uh, in the kind of phenomena we observe before we can really write down the theorems about them that, that we should be writing down. Uh, but one important thing to note about experiments is that sometimes experiments are wrong. And I think that uh, theorists are very uh, critical of experiments because they could potentially be wrong. Right, and I, uh, but I think that's okay. That's just a, a property of science, right? You do experiments, uh, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. You know, in future experiments and future studies, we'll try to either validate uh, or debunk uh, 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 theories. So some of the stuff that I'll talk about today, I'm gonna talk about uh, dimensionality and image manifolds. That's where low dimensionality is gonna come in. I'll talk about uh, loss landscape geometry, and then I'll talk a bit about uh, some theories behind why uh, optimizers might find good minima in, in uh, lost landscapes. Uh, and the overall goal of this talk is to try to develop intuition rather than rigor, right? So I wanna to look at some of these uh, phenomena like generalization and try to get some intu intuitive explanations for why these behaviors might be happening that don't require uh, complicated theorems, right? So uh, to sort of set the tone for the talk, I usually like to show this slide. These are the nutrition facts for this talk. In this talk, you are going to get 0% of your daily value of math. Uh, but you are hopefully going to get 100% uh, of your daily value of pictures. And then maybe from that, we'll develop a little bit of intuition, right? So those are the goals. Um, 
so forgive me if you are if you are a person that that uh, really does not like empirical studies. You're going to have to forgive me a little bit, and you have to uh, be aware of the fact that sometimes when we do experimental science, uh, there's a bit of uncertainty that we just have to be willing to accept. All right. So one of the first things I like to talk about is dimensionality in image sets. So this is the stuff that really relates to finding low dimensionality. Um, so it's known that uh, high dimensionality is really bad for learning. And there's a bunch of theoretical results that, that basically say this. The simplest one that you can observe is that if you want to accurately learn a one Lipschitz function on a cube, you have to sample all the vertices. And that's kind of clear because the vertices on a unit cube are all you know, at least one unit apart from each other. And so if you know that the function is smooth, maybe it's one Lipschitz, you can put any 0, 1 vertex on each of these uh, each, you could put any zero one label on any of these vertices, right? And that doesn't tell you anything about uh, the, the missing vertices if all you know is that the function is smooth, right? So if you want to learn a smooth function uh, on a unit cube, you have to sample all the vertices. And that means you have to sample an exponential number of points, right? In n dimensions, you got to sample two of the n data points to identify that function. That's bad. Right? So that's kind of a simple example, but people have definitely uh, done much deeper dives into the, the difficulty of learning in high dimensions. Um, so, for example, I really like these uh, Narayanan and Mitter papers. Um, so it's known, for example, that learning a manifold, so if you want to learn a, a manifold, right, uh, that has uh, bounded extrinsic curvature and you want to learn the, the location of the manifold to epsilon accuracy, the way that this is typically done is you sample points on the manifold and you try to come up with some sort of mesh representation for it. Uh, but it's known that the uh, cost of learning a manifold with um, D implicit dimensions is exponential in, in D. Right, so this is exponential cost. It's also known that if you have already have identified a manifold and you just want to learn a smooth decision boundary on that manifold, that also has cost that is exponential in the dimension uh, of the manifold. Right, so learning a manifold is really really hard uh, in high dimensions, and yet we seem to be able to solve these really high dimensional problems. Right, we've you know quote unquote solved ImageNet at least to some extent. Solving ImageNet requires us to learn a smooth function on the unit cube. Right? Our images generally live in a unit cube. They have you know, in pixel intensities. They're usually scaled between 0 and 1, and you've got lots of them. So we're learning smooth functions in the high-dimensional unit cube, and we somehow we do it. Right? We're also able to do really effective manifold learning. This is StyleGAN. We just saw a bunch of uh, examples of this uh, in the last talk. Right? So StyleGAN, we're basically, we, we take a whole bunch of random samples from a manifold, and then we actually are able to identify the manifold pretty uh, amazingly well. And so the, and the number of samples that we're using to do it are, are quite small, maybe just a few million. And when you compare that to the exponential cost of learning a manifold, that seems like uh, not so much, right? So what that tells us is that there has to be some sort of really strong low dimensional uh, behavior at play here, right? Uh, it almost certainly has to be the case that these sort of image manifolds we're trying to learn have some sort of low dimensional structure that is being exploited. I um, mean, that the, the sorts of image manifolds that we're learning when we do something like classify ImageNet also have to have some sort of uh, low dimensional structure, right? Um, and so, oops, that is the, oops, I somehow just skipped to the end of my talk. Let's go back. Um, ah, here we go. Okay, so here's some questions that I would like answers to. Can we, uh, can we explicitly measure the low dimensional structure of these manifolds? So can we actually use dimensionality estimation methods to sort of pull out what those dimensions are? Um, and just how, how low dimensional are they, right? If we, can, if we can apply these tools to these image manifolds, can we actually say something uh, quantitative about how low dimensional these things are? So there are methods that are really effective at estimating the implicit dimensionality of manifolds. And we have a, a paper where we go into a few different ones and examine a few different uh, methods for measuring dimensionality. But a really popular one is this method of uh, Lamita and Bickle. It's called the, the MLE estimator. And the idea behind this estimator is that if you have, let's say you have a point, this gray point in the middle of a manifold, uh, and you randomly sample a bunch of other data points on that manifold, you could look at the distance between the closest nearest neighbor and the second closest nearest neighbor. And it turns out that the log of the ratio of that difference, so if you look at how much bigger the second closest uh, near, how much further the second closest neighbor is than the, further, than, the, than the first closest nearest neighbor, you take the log of that quantity, that scales like e to the negative d, where d is the dimensionality of the manifold. 
And so using this principle, they derive what they call these MLE estimators. The reason it's called MLE is because they basically model the number of, when you sample points in a manifold, they model the number of points that occur in the neighborhood of this gray data point as a Poisson process. And then what they're essentially doing is they're, they're coming up with an MLE estimator uh, for the rate of that Poisson process. So there's a long derivation for this formula, but essentially this is a maximum likelihood estimator for the dimensionality of a manifold. And it only requires you to measure the distance between uh, data points on your manifold and the K nearest neighbors. So you pick some K, you figure out how many K nearest neighbors you want to use. Usually we use like five or 10, uh, and then you can compute this quantity and it gives you uh, an estimator that is asymptotically unbiased for the implicit dimensionality of your manifold. And a few things that I'll mention is when we apply these estimators, we're actually computing the average uh, of this estimator over all of the data points in our, that, we, that we sample in our data set. So we're not picking a data point and trying to estimate the dimensionality around it. In order to get the noise in our estimates down as low as possible, we're going to average these estimators over all the points in our manifolds. And so that gives you some concept of uh, something like the average dimensionality of a manifold. It could be that uh, you might have a, a set of images that has higher dimensional structure in one region and lower dimensional structure in another. And in order to get relatively no, low noise estimators, we have to uh, create some sort of estimate of the average dimensionality. Um, and also the particular estimator we use uh, is, is based off this Levina and Bickel estimator, but there's a particular debiasing update that's been uh, proposed that allows you to uh, get at more accurate estimates with, with uh, smaller sample sizes. Okay, so what question we want to ask is, can you actually apply these ML estimate, MLE estimators to really complicated image data sets? Um, and in the literature, they've been applied to all sorts of manifold problems. For example, they've used to analyze the dimensionality of the feature representations of neural nets. But the question is, can you apply them at the image scale or at the image net scale even? Um, and it turned out that instead of this being really a mathematical challenge, it's more of an engineering challenge. And so uh, Philip Pope, I and my group led this team that built a, a big distributed implementation of these MLE estimators that allows you to basically pour ImageNet into a maximum likelihood estimation algorithm and try to pull out uh, the dimensionality of, of a set of images. Right, but before we do that, one question we want, might want to ask is, is, is it even sane to think that you can do dimensionality estimation on, on an image data set? Um, and, and so to validate that, we wanted to do an experiment where we generate image data, where we know what the dimensionality is, so it's controlled, and then see whether we can back that dimensionality back out using these sorts of MLE estimation methods. And so we do that using uh, BigGAN. So what BigGAN does, it starts with a random vector. You take a 128-dimensional uh, random Gaussian vector, you push it through BigGAN, which is a big deconvolutional neural network, and then BigGAN spits out an image uh, like a Basenji. Uh, which I just learned while I was making slides for this talk, the Basenji is, is, uh, is a dog that doesn't bark. So if you're looking for a quiet dog, you should get a, a Basenji. I wish my neighbor had gotten Basenji. Um, but anyways, uh, so this, this gives us a tool that we can use to control the dimensionality of, uh, of, uh, of image data sets. And so what we did is we did an experiment where we lock a bunch of these dimensions to zero. So I'm gonna freeze a bunch of the dimensions in the latent representation to zero, and I'm only going to let a small number of these dimensions float around. And that allows us to create uh, image subsets that have controlled dimensionality. And then we can see whether we can estimate that dimensionality uh, just by taking samples of the GAN and dumping them into an MLE estimator. And so we can do something like this. We generate a bunch of these uh, 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 barkless dogs using different uh, dimensions. So we can let the dimensions run, uh, run from eight dimensions Right, all the way up to 128 dimensions, which is um, maximum dimension now you can get out of big GAN. And then we can pour these things into our estimator and see uh, how good we can do. Now, for, for low dimensional data sets, this is pretty easy. So this is 10 dimensional Basenji. So this dotted line is the dimension you want to estimate. Uh, this is using K 10, uh, a 10 nearest neighbors based estimator. And as the number of image samples increases, we see that this uh, estimator uh, sort of increases to the dimensionality we're trying to estimate and actually settles down uh, on 10 dimensions pretty well. Estimating, uh, so we only did a few thousand image samples to do that. If you want to estimate really high dimensional data sets, you need a lot more data. Uh, so this is an example of trying to estimate a 32 dimensional tree frog data set. So here's some examples of these 32 dimensional tree frogs. Um, and if we apply some of these different estimators with different Ks, we find that uh, if we use a large number of K nearest neighbors. So as we increase the number of K, we're sort of increasing our dimensionality estimator. If you use a relatively large number uh, of nearest neighbors, and you also use a lot of image samples, we can actually converge to this 32 
uh, dimensional estimate. But in this case, for this convergence to happen, we needed around a million samples, right? Which is quite a lot. Um, but fortunately, we actually, you know, we have access to image data sets where we can actually uh, uh, get that many samples. Okay, so what happens when you actually throw these estimators at realistic image data sets? Um, so we are able to estimate some uh, uh, dimensions for these different things. Like for MNIST, we estimate a dimension of about 12. For CIFAR 10, we get about 25. Interestingly, Celeb A, which has a much higher extrinsic dimensionality than CIFAR 10, our estimators say that it has about the same intrinsic dimensionality of CIFAR 10. Um, and uh, that may just be because, you know, Alex was mentioning in his talk that for, the, for, for GANs on Celeb A to work, you really need faces to be centered. You know, all of the faces in uh, Celeb A are sort of centered and frontalized, whereas um, there's a lot more variation in some sense in CIFAR 10. So maybe that's the reason why these, these two data sets end up having similar dimensionalities. And then we can go up to still more, more and more complex data sets like MS Coco and ImageNet. Once you get up to ImageNet, we're estimating a dimensionality of 43, which I think is actually shockingly low um, for such a complex uh, for such a complex data set. So we can actually actually observe some of the effects of dimension. Uh, hi. Yep. Hi, Tom. Sorry to interrupt. I think we just got a question from Inchia. How the distance is defined here? We're actually just using L2 distances. You mean the nearest neighbor distances? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yes. OK, yeah. L2. Thanks for the clarification. Um, okay, so we can actually observe the effect of this learning of, of dimensionality on learning. So you would expect uh, it to be more difficult for a neural network to learn um, to learn uh, in higher dimensional settings, right? So this is using ResNet 18 to, to do uh, this Basenji versus Beagle uh, two class problem using ImageNet data. And what we find is that if we just, we can generate Basenji and Beagle data sets with different dimensionalities. And what we find is that for low dimensional data sets, so this is a 16 dimensional data set, a very small number of samples, you, you almost immediately get saturation and, and near 100% uh, test accuracy, right? But as we increase the dimensionality, learning becomes slower. And once you get up to 128 dimensional percentages, um, I see that this learning curve is much slower and it takes many, many more samples uh, before it saturates. In fact, there aren't enough uh, samples in the ImageNet data set for this curve seemingly to, uh, to saturate. So this is uh, comparing two different data sets where we freeze the extrinsic dimensionality and you just turn this intrinsic dimensionality knob. Uh, whereas if we freeze the intrinsic dimensionality, so this is 128 dimensional Basenji versus Beagle, so 128 implicit dimensions, we're going to freeze the implicit dimensionality and we're just going to turn the extrinsic dimensionality knob. So we're going to go from 16 by 16 images all the way up to 256 by 256. And we find that, you know, modulo some fluctuations, we actually get pretty similar all learning dynamics for all of these things. So this is what we got uh, when we change the intrinsic dimensionalities. There's definitely some differentiation between these things in terms of their learning dynamics, whereas they all lie close to on top of each other, right? If uh, if if we if we freeze the intrinsic dimensionality. Um, so you might think uh, people have uh, looked at this and said this sort of behavior is sort of obvious, right? The extrinsic dimensionality of your images shouldn't matter, but it's actually not so obvious to me that. Um, but it's, it's clear that an optimal classifier should not be affected by extrinsic dimensionality. But what's not so clear is that a neural network can behave like an optimal classifier and actually sift through all of these nuisance dimensions to identify uh, the important ones that are left. But it seems like neural nets actually do that quite well. Okay, so moving on, I'm gonna turn a page uh, a little bit and I wanna talk about some of the work we've done on understanding optimization and generalization in neural networks through an empirical lens. So optimization happens on this neural net loss landscape. You can think of a neural network as a, a function that accepts an image X and spits out a label Y. And it depends on these parameters, W, the weights that control this behavior. And we train a neural network by cooking up some sort of loss function. Maybe it's just as simple as a least squares loss function. It's probably more like a cross entropy loss function. But the, the loss function measures how close the predictions of your model and your data match the labels that it should. And the loss function lives in very high dimensions. So the dimensionality of the loss function uh, is the dimensionality of the parameter space, which for a lot of commonly used neural networks is about 10 million-ish dimensional. And a question you might ask is, how non-convex are these loss functions? Are they insanely pathologically non-convex? They have non-linearities layered on top of non-linearities layered on top of non-linearities. So you might think that would result in something very non-convex. But at the same time, we just do gradient descent and we consistently optimize these things and march straight down to a global min. And so maybe there's not so much 
uh, non-convex behavior, right? Um, and so in order to explore this sort of uh, lost landscape behavior empirically, we use simple lost landscape visualization. So we start by, uh, you take a random initialization in parameter space, you run SGD until you find a minimum. And then we're going to take two random lines to this minimum in parameter space. So what we're essentially doing is taking a random two-dimensional slice out of parameter space, and then we rasterize over it. So we sweep back and forth over that slice and we use uh, GPUs just compute the loss function at each of these points in order to see what they look like. And we can uh, use these sorts of visualizations to examine uh, questions like how does neural architecture impact the loss function? Um, so one thing we like to look at is, is uh, how do skip connections impact the loss function, right? That's one really simple feature of neural architectures. So we look at two different types of architectures. There's VGG-like architectures that just, that just alternate between convolution, batch norm, and ReLU, convolution, batch norm, ReLU. And then we have uh, ResNet architectures. ResNet architectures have skip connections in them where information jumps over two convolutional blocks at a time and then gets added with the output of the convolutional blocks. And one of the reasons that I like to use ResNets as opposed to other more complicated skip connection architectures is with ResNets, because the skip connection is just doing an addition, I can throw out these skip connections without changing the number of parameters in the network. And so that gives us a, a way to control for uh, things like number of parameters and uh, parameter structure. We can compare networks side by side that have very similar architectures other than these uh, skip connections. So if we actually plot these sort of things, here's what we get. This is a 56 layer neural network trained on CIFAR-10. Uh, this is a VGG-like net, so there's no skip connections. And you see that there's a minimum, uh, the minimum's in the center of the loss landscape here, and there's a lot of non-convexity around it. But if we add skip connections in, so we add residual connections back into this landscape, we get something like this. So we see that adding those residual connections really convexifies this landscape quite a lot. And if you put them side by side, you can see there's a really dramatic difference going on there. So if you want to get a little bit more detail, let's look at some uh, contour plots. So if you look at a nine layer VGG like net, you'll see that there's not a lot of crazy non-convex behavior here, right? There is some non-convexity in the contours, but for the most part, if you were to start at a contour, say here and march perpendicular to the contours doing SGD, you'd probably end up in the middle of this basin, right? If we go up to a deeper network still, so this is a, a VGG-like network with, uh, with 20 layers, you get something like this. And one thing I've, I've, I spent a lot of time doing is looking at these plots and asking what's the difference between them. And what's, this is 20 layers, let's go back to nine layers. How is nine layers any different than 20 layers? And to me, I don't really see any qualitative differences at all. It seems like up until about 20 layers, we observe that you get these very nice convex-like behaviors um, and that's interesting because prior to skip connections, the, the deepest networks we had were things like VGG19, right? We got up to about 20 layers and then we stopped being able to train things effectively. If we go much beyond 20 layers, there's a sudden emergence of chaotic behavior. So like this is uh, ResNet56, but with all the skip connections taken out. And you'll see that you get these poorly conditioned minimums with these uh, nasty plateaus of really chaotic behavior. And so it seems like there's some sort of uh, transition behavior. If we keep going deeper still, you just continue to get uh, these sorts of really chaotic behaviors. And so it seems like there's some sort of phase transition behavior going on here, right? Shallow networks consistently have the same sort of convex behaviors. I can't even tell you how deep a network is by looking at it until you get to a deep enough threshold where suddenly they get this emergence of chaos and you get these really chaotic uh, behaviors in the landscape. These kinds of neural networks are things that we don't use. We don't use uh, deep architectures like this without skip connections. But interestingly, when you add the skip connections in, it prevents this sort of phase transition behavior from taking place. So we can start with uh, ResNet 20, 56, 110. We've gone out to about 350 layers and we don't observe this sort of chaotic transition that happens uh, that is observable when you don't have skip connections in the, in the architecture. Um, so just to sort of hammer in the difference between these architectures, here's a three-dimensional plot. This is a uh, VGG 110. The reason we did this architecture, the 110 layer network, is because we couldn't, we wanted to look at dense net with and without skip connections, but we couldn't get dense net to train without skip connections. This is dense net 121 is, is pretty close in terms of uh, architecture and number of parameters to, uh, to a ResNet 110. And so we looked at a ResNet 110 with no skip connections. And you'll see that there's this sort of blue lagoon. So blue is low and high is red in the lost landscape here. This little blue lagoon of a, a minimizer surrounded by this mountain range of uh, non-convexity. Whereas if you look at something like DenseNet 121, 
it's incredibly smooth. It's so smooth it almost looks like a paraboloid, except that the bottom is even uh, flatter than a paraboloid, right? So these behave almost as if they are um, convex loss functions. So another thing that we also examined is the width of a network. I think with all the NTK literature going on, this is uh, an interesting topic. Um, but if you look at VGG versus non-VGG-like networks, as you widen the networks, we see that it really relaxes the loss landscape. And even just by widening a network, you can get a lot of the non-convexities in the loss landscape to relax and, uh, and disappear, which I think is quite interesting. So the seeming convexity of these loss landscapes might shed some light on why we're able to optimize them. And I think these sort of uh, convex light behaviors that neural nets have, have inspired a lot of people to try to prove uh, results about optimization. I think a particular popular, particularly popular topic is trying to examine whether or not there are local minima in neural networks, right? And there's a, a number of papers showing that linear neural networks have no local mins. And in some situations, we can even show that simple nonlinear neural networks have, have no local minima. But one of the things that we were interested in is whether or not these sorts of theoretical claims uh, turn out to be true. Right? So the first thing that we did is we just did a search to see if we could find uh, local mins. And what we found is that just by initializing the bias parameters in our neural network to non-zero numbers, you can very easily get trapped at local mins. So if we uh, see we train ResNet 50 and we, uh, we initialize with standard with zeros for the bias parameters, which is the standard initialization, you get stuck at a, you get, well, you don't get stuck, you, you decay to a loss function of 0 0.0061 at the end of our training script. And this just keeps going down and down and down if we keep training. Whereas if we uh, pick uniform numbers between plus 10 and minus 10, then we can easily get stuck at a, a local min uh, with loss value 0.22. And then if we train with even larger randomly chosen biases, we actually get stuck at uh, 2.32 random initialization uh, for a 10 class problem with cross entropy loss generally gives you a loss of about 2.5. And so this decayed very little. It, it moved away from the, uh, from the initialization just a little bit and then it got stuck, right? So it seems like there are definitely local mins in these loss landscapes. And one thing I'll mention is we actually verified that these are not saddle points. We did eigenvalue computations on the Hessian to estimate the minimal eigenvalue until we're actually able to find things that are not saddle points. OK, so one of my students, uh, Michael Goldblum, who's a postdoc now, uh, was interested in, in, in this question of how realistic theoretical results are that predict that there are no uh, local mins. And he came up with what I like to call an anti-theorem because what it essentially says is while you're able to formulate problems uh, for which you can prove that neural nets have no local mins, those sorts of formulations don't describe the sorts of problems that we like to solve with neural nets empirically. And here's how he showed that. So suppose that you have manifold data. So you wanna separate the green from the blue, but it's not a, a linear classification problem, right? A linear classifier is going to achieve a relatively large loss because it can't separate everything in the training data. Whereas a neural network might be able to, you know, squeeze between these manifold boundaries and achieve uh, a near zero loss. And so this is an in, a somewhat informal statement of his, his theorem, although the actual assumptions of the theorem are quite weak. But he says that if you want to solve a problem like this, you have a loss function that depends on a data, data set and labels, and you have a, a predictor function, uh, f sub theta, parameterized by theta, and there's two options for f. You could choose f to be a linear function of theta, or you could choose it to be a multi-layer perceptron. And what he shows is that if you, if uh, the neural network, so when you plug in a neural network into this loss function, if the neural network achieves a lower loss than the linear classifier on a particular data set, then the neural, loss, the neural net loss function has a local minimum, right? So what this says is that the, 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 uh, the set of, of problems for which there are local mins in your loss landscape is precisely the set of problems for which it's worth using a neural net. Right? If, you, if you're able to fit your data better using a neural network than you are using a linear model, um, then there is a local min uh, in the loss landscape. OK, so we know that there is some convexity behavior inside of these, uh, at least local convexity behavior in these loss functions. But we also know that there are lots of, there are local mins, right? There's local mins, there's, there's uh, uh, you know, uh, ununique global mins, right? There's a whole landscape of, of minima that spread out uh, when, you, when you try to optimize these things. And one of the consequences of this is that generalization in neural nets is a surprise. Um, and I don't have to 
tell uh, anyone in this workshop this. I think a lot of us are familiar with uh, all the theoretical uh, complexities of, of neural nets. Right? But essentially what happens is that you, if you want to solve a simple decision problem like this, right? so once again, you want to separate the blue from the green, you could draw a decision boundary that looks like this. right? That's a good decision boundary. And the reason why it's good is because if I drop in test data that was not used for training, so I drop in these uh, extra points, they're still classified correctly, right? But I could have drew, drawn a class, a decision boundary for the for the training data that, that looks something like this, right? If I drew a decision boundary like this, all the blue points, the solid blue points are still above the decision boundary. All the solid green points are still below it. And so we actually get zero training loss, right? We perfectly classified the data. And yet this decision boundary is bad. It does not perform well on test data. And the question is, why is it that the neural net knows to find this smooth decision boundary instead of this insane decision boundary, right? When you're doing optimization on the loss function, both of these decision boundaries are the same to the optimizer, seemingly, right? Both of them uh, achieve zero loss, right? And the gradients uh, vanish at both of them. And so why is it that the optimizer knows, especially when you start with some crazy random initialization with you know, crazy random decision boundaries, why is it that we're able to converge to these sorts of nice, uh, nice models rather than these sorts of insane ones? Um, and there's a lot of great theory papers that are trying to explain this behavior using a variety of different mathematical assumptions. I'm not gonna try to delve into all of them. Uh, one that I think is particularly uh, interesting as we'll mention later is this uh, Zugadim and Roy approach that actually uh, uses flatness assumptions to uh, prove generalization bounds. I'll mention that paper again later. And a lot of this work is terrific, but I think a lot of these papers don't necessarily give me a simple intuition for what's actually going on in neural networks. And so one thing we would like is to have some visualizations and experiments that can hopefully say something uh, that is plausible about what could be causing these sorts of generalization uh, phenomena. So the first thing we wanted to start with was just drawing a picture of generalization. One might think that, and you know, I think sort of a naive uh, idea of generalization is that if you have a really good model class like convolutional nets, it might be that any minimum of a loss function, any global min uh, is good because the implicit uh, bias of just the class of models is, is really, really good, right? So we wanted to come up with a picture of generalization. And so here's what we did. We start with a random point in parameter space. Now we're gonna solve just a simple two class problem. This is the Swiss roll. And we're gonna solve it with a four layer MLP. So we start with a random point in parameter space and we run SGD and SGD swirls around through parameter space and it converges to this minimum over here that gets 98.5% accuracy. We projected everything down into two dimensions with the Tisney embedding just so that we can see uh, what's going on in this high dimensional space. And then a question we could ask is, are there bad minima in this loss landscape? And do they lie near the SGD trajectory? And so what we did is we, we cooked up a special optimizer called a poisoned optimizer that I'll talk about in a little bit. The poisoned optimizer, its goal is to look for bad minima that minimize the loss function, but don't generalize. And so we can initialize that poisoned optimizer with each of these iterates of SGD. We took the value of the uh, uh, SGD solution at the end of each uh, training epoch, and we initialized our bad optimizer, and we found these bad minima. So these bad minima are color-coded by their accuracy. So the, the color, the, uh, the bluish hue tells you how accurate they are. The most accurate of any of these bad minima is 53% accuracy on the test data. Um, but they are minima of the loss function. So on the training data, they all get 100%, right? All these blue points ace the training data, uh, but they all flunk the test data. What we find is that this SGD trajectory actually carves through this minefield of bad minima. It misses all of them, and then it lands over here at this 98.5% accuracy good minimum, right? All of these this is a two-class problem. All of these bad minima are, are not much better than a, than a random guess, right? And somehow it knows to avoid all of those bad non-generalizing minima, and it lands over here in this basin that gets 98.5% accuracy. Right, so a, I think a reasonable question to ask is just what gives, what is going on that can produce this kind of generalization behavior? So first thing I wanna mention is stuff that I think doesn't matter very much. I think some of this, these things are overblown in the literature. Uh, I don't think the optimizer matters very much. People like to talk about how uh, stochastic gradient descent has a very particular implicit bias that is causing generalization. 
but actually you can run a whole bunch of different optimizers. This is train and test accuracy under the same computation budget um, for CPAR 10. And we find that we get similar uh, training and test accuracies for a lot of different optimizers like SGD with momentum and s acceleration and then precondition things like Atom and Atagrad. Um, then we can look at more exotic optimizers like, uh, like RMS prop, like uh, Prox prop, which uses alternating mean squares, LBFTS. We actually have a paper where we're using ADM to train neural networks uh, and we get uh, pretty reasonable results. Um, not quite state of the art, but you can still get pretty good generalization. And so it seems like no matter what optimizer you pick, you seem to actually be able to get generalization behavior, provided that you're able to get the, the optimizer to converge, right? So it seems like generalization is really more of a property of the loss function than it is of the particular optimizer you chose. Now that's not to say that there aren't subtle differences between the optimizers, right? Uh, and, but it's just that you get a huge generalization boost for free just from using a neural net model, right? And then because we all get this huge generalization boost for free, the only thing left to fight over is the stuff you don't get for free. And so everyone is, you know, hyper parameter tuning and architecture searching and tweaking their models and trying different regularizers to try to get that extra percent accuracy out on top of the, the generalization that you would get from using any optimizer. Another thing that doesn't seem to matter much is batch size. People like to talk about a lot about how the stochasticity in SGD matters a lot, and you can't have that stochasticity without a small batch size. And I think in some older studies, it was empirically observed that you needed a small batch size to do well, and I think that's where that intuition comes from. But actually, you can do quite well without uh, a small batch size. So I just did a naive experiment where I took a CPAR 10 training script that was optimized for batch size 128, and I just turned the batch size up and up and up until I got to 50,000. So this is full batch gradient descent. Every image is being used on every gradient descent iteration. I made no uh, optimizations at all to try to get the accuracy to be good. Um, but on ResNet 18, the accuracy did degrade from 94 to 89%. If I can cook up an SVM model with the same number of parameters as, as ResNet 18, it actually only gets 48%, right? So we're actually doing pretty well. I'm convinced we could do better by hyperparameter tuning. Uh, but all I did is I turned the learning rate down. And then actually, to get things to converge with the batch size 50,000, I had to use a, a monotonic backtracking line search. Um, and so I turned on all of those things. And finally, I got it to converge. I didn't do anything beyond that. I just got it to converge once. 89% uh, accuracy, which is actually still a significant amount of generalization. And actually, there's been a lot of papers trying to use huge batch sizes and, and, and fine tune things to get good accuracy. For example, this paper. Um, training image net in an hour and then people kind of push that down until we got to training image net in four minutes and the way people do these things is by using huge batch sizes so these folks are able to train image net with a batch size of 64,000 right which has uh, you know a really small amount of noise there's not a tremendous amount of stochasticity going on once you get to a batch size of 64,000 and yet they're actually able to get pretty amazing results on image net better than I think you know prior to 2011 people would have ever believed was was possible and then one thing I also want to mention is what about the neural tangent kernel? This is something I have sort of mixed feelings about. Um, but in our in our uh, this paper, Truth or Backpropaganda, we kind of delve into a lot of different uh, theories for generalization and, and do experiments to sort of examine them. One of the things that we look at, um, one of the things we looked at was this uh, whether or not there's local mins in the landscape. And one of the things we look at is this NTK hypothesis. So one of the things we look at is whether the neural tangent kernel uh, stabilizes as networks get wider and wider with realistic architectures. And so what we did is we took a, a random slice out of the NTK for CIFAR 10. When I say a random slice, I mean, we just took uh, 20 random images out of the data set. And we look at a slice of the neural tangent kernel corresponding to those 20 images. And then we look at how much the, the kernel uh, changes before and after training. So we just see how correlated are the two kernels at the initialization and at the end of training. And we get weird trends for some realistic architectures. But actually, interestingly, for a simple four layer comment with no batch norm, what we find is that as the number of parameters blows up, the, uh, the, uh, that correlation between the, the NTK values before and after training starts to get higher and higher and get closer and closer to one. So it actually, we are able to observe the stabilization of the neural tangent kernel within a, you know, a realistic and computable regime of parameters. And I have to be honest, I was very skeptical of these, you know, stability of the NTK claims for realistic model architectures when we did this experiment, but we're actually able to, to observe it. So I don't know that this is really debunking anything. But what I will say is that 
generalization, we start to observe generalization phenomenon for these models with around 10,000 parameters, right? So generalization is actually quite good uh, before we get to this regime where the NTK uh, is really starting to stabilize. And so I do think that stabilization of the snow tangent kernel is observable for reasonable model sizes. I'm still lukewarm on NTK theories. I think that they may be uh, explaining generalization using properties that are not necessarily the ones that are responsible for the strong generalization behaviors that we observe in practice. And I say that just because we are able to observe really strong generalization behaviors when we're quite far away from this uh, wide network regime. Okay, so there are a number of different theories of generalization. There's one that I, I particularly partial to that involves you know, flat versus sharp minima. And a lot of the reasons I like that theory is because it's, it's very empirical. A lot of the, the theory of flat versus sharp has really been motivated by empirical studies. Um, and so uh, we have a project that was uh, led by Ronnie Huang, who was, uh, was postdoc uh, at the time, and he's now moved to Google Research, and uh, a number of other students uh, that, that participated. Sayada Mom, a math PhD student, Michael Goldblum, who's now a postdoc, Liam Fowl is another math student, Justin Terry, a computer science student, and Farong Huang, who's uh, one of my uh, collaborators, faculty member at UMD. Okay. So we wanted to uh, build ways of exploring good minima and bad minima. We want to find good minima and bad minima, and we want to, to put them next to each other and look at them and then just see how they're different and then see whether that tells us anything about why uh, optimizers might prefer to find these uh, good minimizers. And the, the problem is that it's hard to find bad minima, right? Or most of the optimizers we use always want to find good minima. And so to find these bad minima, we had to use uh, develop a new tool. We, we use data set poisoning in order to do it. Here's the idea behind data set poisoning. Normally when you solve a network training problem, you have you know, two classes you wanna separate and you're gonna minimize the cross entropy loss. The cross entropy loss is zero when you classify things right and it's big when you classify things wrong. So we wanna find a bad minimum. What's a bad minimum? A bad minimum is a, a gives, gives you a decision boundary that classifies all the training data perfectly but it flunks the a holdout set of test data, right? So we're gonna write down a loss function that just describes that criteria. You do really well on the training data, so the cross entropy is small on the training data, but you flunk a bunch of test data. So what we do is we drop in a bunch of data, we call this poisoning data, and then we add a new term to the loss function, that's the reverse cross entropy. The reverse cross entropy is, is, is something that is zero when you classify things wrong, and it's big when you classify things right. So we take the reverse cross entropy over this poison data set. And now we have a loss function that says you have to get zero cross entropy loss on the training data, but you have to flunk the test data. And so you solve this optimization problem, you get a terrible decision boundary that corresponds to a bad minimum in the original loss landscape. And now we throw away that poison data. We're never gonna look at it again. We're not gonna use it for testing. We're gonna test with a completely independent uh, data set. But by solving that problem, we were able to identify a neural network configuration that, uh, that minimizes the original training loss. It's perfectly accurate on the training data, but it, it does not perform well at test time. So that allows us to find bad minimums. And in fact, that's how we found these bad minimums, right? We started with one of these uh, SGD iterates and we flip the switch and we turn on poisoning. And then that steps off the SGD path and finds a nearby minimizer of the training loss that does not generalize. Okay, so now that we're able to find good minima and bad minima, we can look at them and we can ask some questions about, uh, you can put them on the workbench and measure them and examine them, ask some questions about why we might be finding good minima instead of bad minima. So one particular hypothesis that I really like is this uh, flat minima hypothesis. It's the idea that flat minima generalize well and sharp minima don't, right? Flat minima just means that the basin around a minimum is wide and sharp minima means that the basin around a minimum is narrow. And this is a hypothesis that was originally proposed uh, by Hockreiter and Schmidt-Huber in 1997. And there's been a bunch of papers that studied it since. Some of these are empirical and some of them are three papers and some of them are both like this Chaudhry paper on entropy SGD uh, has theoretical results that can uh, prove uh, uh, you get good classification accuracy with, uh, with flat minima using a, this entropy-based measure of flatness. Um, I like this uh, Zuckerman and Roy paper. It uses a measure of flatness similar to what we use experimentally, and they're able to compute uh, non-vacuous generalization bounds for a range of neural networks, uh, provided that you found a flat minimum. So if you do optimization and you find a minimum that is flat, then they can use uh, pack-based theorem to show that you can prove a non-vacuous -general, non generalization bound for that flat minimum.
Okay, so there's a lot of theory and experiments for these flat minima, but I think that the, the, the results that are out there, especially the experimental results, don't give you a lot of intuition for what's going on. We can observe that flat minima tend to generalize well and sharp minima tend to generalize poorly, uh, but that doesn't tell me why flat minima generalize well. So here's the way that I, I think about flat minima. This is sort of a, a completely intuition-based explanation that is completely non-rigorous. So I think there are different pathways to try to make it rigorous. I think of flatness as a, as a, a, a measure of the margin for manifold classifiers. So typically, if you have two different data sets, if you want to classify them, you don't want to just find any classifier. You want to find the widest margin classifier that you can. And for linear classifiers, it's really easy to define what it means for the margin to be wide. But it's not so easy. Someone actually brought this up during John Wright's talk. You could have manifolds that are sometimes they pinch together, and sometimes they're far apart, and sometimes they're curvy, and sometimes they're flat. right? So how do you define a wide margin for manifolds? Well, flatness is sort of like a flatness of the, the lost landscape minimizer, sort of like a wide margin, wide margin criteria for manifolds. So suppose that you find a minimum of the loss function and it's flat. That means that you can perturb the parameters without increasing the loss, right? If you make a big perturbation of the parameters, what happens? So you grab onto the parameters and parameter space and you wiggle them around randomly. And because the minimizer is flat, the loss function doesn't go up. But what that means is when you add large perturbations to the parameters, you're wiggling around the decision boundaries in input space, right? So as you move the network parameters around, you're also making perturbations to the decision boundaries. And if the minimum is flat, that means that when you perturb the decision boundaries, they don't make contact with the training data, right? So uh, essentially that means that you have a wide margin. If you can make an enormous perturbation to your parameters without changing the loss at all, then you can make large changes to the decision boundaries without sweeping over the training data. And so the margin is large. If you look at a bad minimum, so a sharp minimum, this kind of squiggles around through space. It passes really close to the, uh, to the training points. It weaves in and out of the data manifolds. And if you make a small perturbation to these decision boundaries, you're going to classify things incorrectly. And so the loss goes up. Right? So that gives you some intuition for why a flat minimum might be good. And we can actually observe that intuition in pictures. So one of the nice things about this uh, simple model problem we looked at is that it was on the Swiss roll. And in the Swiss roll, it's a two-dimensional problem, and you can, you can visualize it really easily. You can see what these decision boundaries look like. Um, so here's our good minimum, 98.5% accuracy. And here is a bad minimum that gets terrible test accuracy. And we can actually look at what those decision boundaries do. And what we find is that good minima, uh, you get really wide margin decision boundaries. So this good minimizer for the Swiss roll, the decision boundaries pass almost right in the middle between these data sets. So you get a really nice wide margin. And then if we look at minima that are not so good, or you'll find that these decision boundaries, they sometimes they pass close to the data points. You get these sort of peninsulas where they, the decision boundaries pass through the data manifold. You know, it's in, in general, it just doesn't have this wide margin property. And if you go to an even worse decision boundary, you get to this point where you have, uh, you know, you have these red points here that lie on this little tiny peninsula that grabs them. Very small changes to the network parameters are going to cause misclassification of these data points. And so you would expect this minimizer to be sharp. And indeed, we can, we can visualize these minimizers and we see that they have the properties that we would expect. So this wide margin minimizer is flat. There's this nice flat uh, spot at the bottom of this basin here. Whereas this uh, bad minimizer is a really narrow margin and, and bad generalization performance. And the minimizer of this is really sharp. It's like there's a little needle at the bottom of this basin. So here's a good minimizer, flat and wide margin. Right? And this is a bad minimizer. It has a narrow basin and it has a narrow margin. And this is compatible with things we can observe on other data sets. So this is street view house number. Right? This is a good minimizer and this is a bad minimizer. And you'll see the basin around the bad minimizer is narrower. And it's the same sort of thing we observed before. So this is uh, DenseNet 121. This is a great uh, minimizer, very good accuracy. This is a not so good minimizer uh, for CIFAR 10. It gets much worse training accuracy and it has a much narrower uh, basin. Okay, so that gives us some intuition for why sharp and flat are important. And like I said, there are three papers that predict generalization behaviors in a rigorous way for flat minima. But one thing that I think is missing from a lot of the generalization literature is answer this question of why generalization uh, happens at all. So it's clear that if you find a good minimum, for example, a flat minimum, then you can prove generalization bounds, and that's been done. 
But uh, what's not so clear is why do our optimizers find those flat minima to begin with? And that's something that I think is not explained by the, the theory papers that are currently uh, available. So the intuition that we have is that, you know, good minima have a wide margin, bad minima have a narrow margin. And that corresponds to something about the width of the basin, right? So those wide margin uh, minima tend to have a nice flat uh, basin. Narrow margin minima tend to have a sharp Basin. So why is it that when you do, uh, say, a random search through parameter space, space with SGD, you tend to land in these flat basins and not these narrow basins? Well, one possible explanation for this that does not require any particularly sophisticated mathematics is that maybe the reason we land in these big flat minima is simply because big things are big. And that makes it really easy to find them, right? So if you want to find a boulder in a haystack, it's easy because boulder has really high volume. If you want to find the needle in a haystack, it's really hard because the needle has a really small volume. And so a random search is unlikely to encounter it, right? So these wide minima have really big basins around them that just occupy a lot of volume. Narrow minima, sharp minima have uh, these narrow basins around them that, that occupy less volume, right? And that's a, a, an explanation that could, that's a very simple explanation that could possibly explain why uh, stochastic optimizers have a higher likelihood of landing in these wide margin basins rather than these sorts of narrow margin basins, right? Now, if you look at these two basins, you might think the width difference between them isn't that extreme, right? Maybe that doesn't explain the consistency of neural nets. But if you consider the curse of dimensionality, uh, then, then maybe this starts to make a little bit of sense, right? So the curse of dimensionality for neural nets might actually be more of a blessing. Curse of dimensionality says that in high dimensions, uh, the difference between the volume of two sets that have different width uh, becomes quite extreme, right? The original formulation of a curse of dimensionality had to do with the volume of sets, right? So if you think about a sphere of radius r in a million dimensions, a sphere of radius r has volume proportional to r to the millionth. And so if you squeeze the radius down just a tiny bit, it has a catastrophic effect on the volume. And that's important because when you're doing a random search through parameter space, the probability of landing in a basin is not proportional to its width. It's proportional to its volume. And so the curse of dimensionality would play a big role here assuming that these, uh, these wide uh, basins actually do indeed contain a lot more volume than these narrow basins. And so one thing we want to do is actually empirically measure the volume disparity between the basins around good minima and bad minima and see how big the disparity is and, and assess whether or not this volume hypothesis is a, is a plausible explanation uh, for generalization, or at least could play a role in generalization. So here's what we did. This is a simple experiment. We took a, um, we found the basin of attraction around a minimum. So you find a minimum, maybe it's a good one, maybe it's a bad one. We chop it off at a loss function cutoff of 0.1. And we can choose different cutoffs. It turns out we get similar results no matter what, what cutoff we choose. But just to keep things simple, let's choose a loss function value of uh, 0.1. And that identifies a region in parameter space that lies inside of that basin. And then what we'll do is we'll just use numerical integration to measure the volume of the, this basin around the minimum and just see how big it is. Well, in order to measure these volumes, we need to have a, a, a way of integrating them that is immune to the curse of dimensionality. Because remember, these live in 10 million dimensional spaces. And so what we did is uh, we use a Monte Carlo integration method. And the idea is that if you, if you represent a, a region in polar coordinates, so let's say that I give you a direction phi, I start at the minimum of the loss function, I give you a direction phi to march in, if you march, if you can define this radial function, r of phi, that just tells you how far you need to get to the edge of the basin before you leave it. And we can evaluate this just by doing a search. You step out in this direction until the loss goes above 0.1. So we can evaluate this. Now, if this was a two-dimensional, uh, if this was a two-dimensional circle, you could integrate this thing. There's a standard formula, you know, integral of one half r squared uh, d phi. That gives you the volume if in, in the area and polar coordinates of of uh, of, of a polar region sort of like this. And it turns out that there's a nice analog of this. You can write that, that integral as uh, an expectation. It's the expectation over randomly drawn phi of r squared. And then in higher dimensions, the analog is that the volume is uh, the volume of an n-dimensional unit sphere times the expected value of r to the n phi. And this expectation is over random directions. So the way that you compute this integral, you just sample a bunch of random directions. So this is around a, a minimum for the CPAR 10 loss function. We took a, a slice through the loss function in a bunch of different random directions and they look like this. There's a little bit of variability uh, between them, uh, but by just using these Monte Carlo integration methods, we can actually estimate the volume of these basins up to a few 
orders of magnitude. And what we find is results that look like this. So this is plotting a generalization gap against volume. So over here, we have low generalization gap minima. This is a minimum that is good. It generalizes well. Over here, we have a minimum that is bad. It does not generalize well. And you'll see that as you go from good minima to bad minima, the volume of the basin around them slopes downwards. And in fact, it slopes downwards a lot. So this is a log, but y-axis is a log axis. And there's 80,000 orders of magnitude difference uh, between these good minima and these uh, bad minima, right? So there's quite a dramatic uh, volume disparity between them. And we can get similar results if we repeat the experiment with different cutoffs instead of using 0.1. We can also get similar results if we use the Swiss roll instead of street view house number. The Swiss roll network is much lower dimensional though, and I don't think that the, the trends we get are quite as smooth as a result, right? But it's very, very difficult to, um, to, uh, to find a sharp minima just because like, you know, presumably because the volume of the basin is small. Uh, just as a fun comparison, if you wanted to throw a dart at the Milky Way, let's say you randomly threw a dart at the Milky Way and you tried to hit a single hydrogen atom, right? The Milky Way is about 31 orders of magnitude bigger in diameter than a hydrogen atom. That means in terms of cross-sectional area, the disparity, you actually have to square this because of dimensionality, right? So the, the air cross-sectional area disparity is actually 62 orders of magnitude. So you'd have to throw 10 to the 62 darts uh, into the Milky Way before you're able to hit a single hydrogen atom. But if you look at the volume disparity between this good minimum and this bad minimum for the Swiss roll, the disparity here is actually 80,000 orders of magnitude, right? So it, you'd have to throw a lot of darts. You throw 10 to the 80,000 darts that hit this minimum before you're able to land uh, in this basin. All right, and then finally, one last thing I wanted to mention uh, is a counterfactual experiment. So the idea is that, you know, the, the optimizers that we have, they like to find wide margin uh, classifiers that have wide basins. So they like to land in uh, locations in the loss function that have the property that uh, when you perturb the network parameters, the, uh, the decision, uh, the labels that you assign to your training points don't change, right? So using that sort of intuition, we could try to design a problem that a neural net can't solve. Uh, and here's one way that you could go about doing that. I think there's actually a lot of uh, more sophisticated ways we could go about this now, but this is just one that we happen to have in our, uh, in our arsenal at the moment. Um, so we designed this decision boundary problem where we have, we have red points and we have blue points and we want to learn the boundaries between them. So if you have a reasonably wide margin between the red points and the blue points on these two inner circles, you'll see that you get a nice wide margin classifier. So this is what we learn with an, with an MLP. And you see that you get a really nice wide margin classifier that almost perfectly splits the distance uh, between these data sets. But if we wanted to make it difficult to solve this problem, what we could do is we can make it so that the, the solution we want, the generalizing solution has a really narrow margin. So I'm gonna take these two inner rings and I'm gonna pinch them together like this. So I move the red points out toward the blue points and now a minimizer that slices between these two rings is going to be really unstable with respect to parameter perturbations. If you sliced a perfect circle between uh, these two rings of data points, it would have the property that a very small perturbation to the parameters would cause a lot of misclassification. And instead, every time we solve this problem with a neural network, we get really geometrically irregular uh, decision boundaries that swoop in and they grab these red points and then they move away from the data set and create a margin and they swoop back in and they grab a red point and they curve away and they swoop and they curve away and they generally curve in different directions. Sometimes we'll get even more exotic behaviors where there's um, sort of fingers that swoop in and grab a red point and then go back out uh, toward the middle of these decision boundaries, right? So when you try to solve a problem where the, the optimal solution you're looking for has a really small margin and is really unstable to parameter perturbations, uh, neural net optimizers don't seem to be able to find those kinds of uh, minimums. Okay, so to wrap up, um, our goal was to come up with some intuition for the uh, behaviors going on in neural nets. And you know, one of the, the hypotheses that we have, and this is you know, taken not just from our own empirical studies, but in a lot of ways these empirical studies are just designed to validate uh, theories that already exist in the literature, right? Is that good, minima, good, minim, good classifiers tend to have a wide margin. Um, and those wide margins correspond to flat uh, minima in the loss function, right? If you find have a really wide decision boundary, then you can perturb the decision boundary a lot. Really wide margin decision boundary, you can make big perturbations to that decision boundary without changing the class labels. And as a result, you're at a flat minimum of the loss function. And because of the curse of dimensionality, it's very difficult to find these sorts of sharp minima in the loss landscape. And you always seem to get uh, captured by these uh, large flat minima.
right? One analogy that I like to, to think about is just like if you're trying to, let's say you have a room and I release a jar of flies into the room and I give you a bow and arrow and I tell you to shoot the flies, but don't hit the back wall. You can draw your bow and arrow and you can release your arrow, but almost every time you're going to sail through the flies and you're going to hit that back wall, right? And it's because there's just a huge volume disparity between the two. And I think that that sort of uh, volumetric behavior can help explain the sort of um, dynamics that we observe where SGD passes through all of these nearby bad mins and, and tends to land in this huge basin of attraction of large volume at the end of the path. And then finally, I wanted to mention that none of what I said today is math. Uh, in fact, one of our goals was to not use math in this talk. Um, I think that there are really interesting ways forward to try to build a theory around some of these ideas. But because these are empirical results and not mathematical results, we can't you know, come up with too many conclusions with absolute certainty. And so if you completely disagree with everything that I've said, uh, I would love to hear from you about it. And uh, you know, that's, those opinions are completely legitimate. Um, all right, so here's a list of uh, papers that I spoke about. And I just wanna say thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. It's been a really great uh, workshop. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, answer them. Assuming we have time, I don't know what the, we're running a little over schedule still. Yes, thank you very much, Tom. Thank I really like this talk. It's a truly a little, uh, great bit of everything that I really like. And I think we have got some questions accumulated in the chat window. So the, I think uh, I, I see a few ones from Aslan. Aslan, if you could unmute yourself, and I think you got a few, so you better ask yourself. Hello, it was a great talk. So I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, you show a plot which showed that uh, in different data sets, what is the di dimension of the data? Mm -hmm. And do you have any, for example, ex 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 experiment which, which was done on very low, low, low dimensional input image? For example, a, a tree, four, something like this. Yes. You, have so, you know, the MLE estimators we use have been used to study manifolds before. And one of the reasons our paper doesn't have a lot of those is just because that has already been done. Uh, for example, by Livina and Bickel. Um, there have been a lot of experiments that have used MLE estimators to identify dimensionality in low dimensional manifolds. And I think that's considered to be accurate. In our experiments, we did do, we did experiments with GAN data with dimensionality from, you know, two up to 40 to try to get, um, assess, okay. assess things. We, what we found is that estimating low dimensionalities like less than 10 is pretty easy and we can just nail that. Okay. Higher dimensionalities, things get a little more wishy-washy because the amount of data you need starts to blow up. Yeah. Do you see any, for example, different behavior? I mean, any crit, crit, critical trans, trans, transition, for example, behavior from the low, low di di dimensional image to the high, high dimensional image? I mean, in your data, do you? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by behavior. I mean, in the data I mean, set. For example, for example uh, when you have a low dimensional image, per prop, 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 probably most learning happens in the low, lower lay, lay, layers. This is Yes. All right. Okay. Yeah. So what's interesting is that um, you know when I say we're estimating the dimensionality, we're we're really only estimating the dimensions that you can resolve. So as yeah. that, let's say that we try to do dimensionality estimation on a piece of paper. What's the dimension of a piece of paper? Yeah. Well, it's a little bit subjective, right? If you start doing dimensionality estimation on it, you're going to estimate a dimension of two for a piece of paper right. until the density of points that you generate is su is such that the points are closer together than the thickness of the piece of paper. And then suddenly your MLE estimator is gonna jump up and estimate a dimensionality of three, right? So these are the dimensions that we can resolve using the amount of data that we have available. So, you know, a million data points for ImageNet. These are the dimensions that are resolvable. Um, and there may so, be other sort of hidden dimensions that are so small that they're not, they're not resolvable. Now, what does it say about neural nets? I'm inclined to think neural nets are probably using these resolvable dimensions just because those are the ones you can resolve with the with the data that's available. But I'm not sure how to, um, you know, I'm not sure how to explain the behaviors of neural nets on these things. I guess I don't know how these dimensions so, get explained. But I think that they the, get the other question about about your your approach loss land 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 okay. escape. Can you define this loss land escape per layer, for example, by Defining two random uh, di 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 direction for the weights mm -hmm. in one specific layer. Lay 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 
is, 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 is it poss poss possible to do yeah, this? We've done, we haven't done a super deep dive on this. You could just do a okay. velocity per layer, which I think would be quite informative, but that's not something that we have done. Upon it, we've done a lot of experiments that, that didn't appear in this talk. Um, okay. But that is not something that we've dove, dove deep into. We have looked at experiments where we look at, let's say, two individual weights. And what we find um, is just so robust that you cannot, you can see almost nothing. So if you plot the landscape with two individual weights, you mm -hmm. find that um, the landscape looks quite flat. But I think that's just because you have so many pathways that are participating in these things that if you just change one ReLU somewhere in the network, that's not enough to generate a, a change in the loss function. That's, I guess, interesting. And the third, third question, uh, do you know, for example, is there any way to quantify generalization per, la per layer? I mean, this is actually, I, I, am, I am not sure if this is a meaningful question. So for example, do we have any uh, mathematical approach that we can quantify? We can say that the gen gen generalization happened mostly in the, for example, first layer, in the second, second layer, or in any, 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 any other, 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 other layer. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to that. My intuition is that there's some sense in which generalization happens more at the early layers. And I say that just because you can do like uh, like stochastic depth where you just drop out entire layers at the end of a ResNet and the layers at the end of a ResNet don't seem to be impacting generalization as much as the early layers empirically. Um, so I guess it seems like in some super hand wavy sense, generalization happens more at the in the earlier layers of the network, but I have no idea how you would actually make that rigorous or how you would quantify that. Okay, okay, okay. thanks, great. So I have a question. Okay, I guess we, yes, Alex, please go ahead. Is, is there time? Sorry, I don't wanna take, yeah. Okay, so- oh, quick, no, we can finish all the questions. Okay, great, great. So uh, Tom, great talk, first of all. Uh, my, I was trying to understand all this flat versus uh, wide uh, minima uh, story. So there's this paper I wrote in the chat uh, by Benjo, actually both Benjo, uh, both uh, Sammy and Joshua Benjo and Dean, uh, Lauren Dean is the first author. So the title is Sharp Minima Can Generalize for Deep Nets. And uh, what, I, what I was uh, understanding from that paper is that one thing you can do is you can take a neuron, multiply all the weights incoming by, you know, 10, multiply the output weight by one over 10, and now the, the network is exactly the same, right? The, the, the input output, the function is the same, but many of those measures of flatness will change. Like if you take the trace of the Hessian or the spectra radius of the Hessian or many. Uh, so I don't know if you, if, if, if you have thought about this or, or if the measures you use are invariant to this. Uh, yeah, the measures we use are actually invariant to that. So this is a lot of detail I didn't go into. We talk in our visualizing lost landscapes paper, we actually talk about this issue a bunch. So this paper makes a claim that sharp minima generalized to. The problem is that by the time this paper came out, I, there were already papers that had shown that to prove generalization. And so th there are rigorous bounds that show that flat minima generalized. Right. Rigorous bounds define flatness in a way that is invariant to all of the transformations that were used in this uh, in the DIN paper. I see, I see. Yeah. So, so it's it's really about how it's defined. So one thing I realized, by the way, when I started thinking about this and then I gave up, is that even if I give you two networks, uh, checking, even checking if they are the same function or not is NP-hard. Yeah. So I, I don't know if that, that that's uh, quite easy to see that uh, you can reduce it to three sad or something like that. Uh, so even even knowing if I give you two networks, if they are the same function or not is is going to be difficult. Sure. Well, how is that related to the sharp versus flat? I, but I guess, but I guess you say that all the definitions for sharpness will have to keep the same, um, the same sharpness for uh, for uh, all the reparameterizations that are the same, right? Uh, well, flatness or sharpness is a local measure of the minimum, right? Now, the flatness measures that we use, you can you can reparameterize your network by either multiplying, scaling up or down individual filters. That doesn't change anything. That's what I showed in the DIN paper or you could uh, per permute the ordering of the neurons and that doesn't change these metrics either. The, uh, so Chaudhry at all of this entropy SGD paper, they also use this entropy based definition of flatness, which is somewhat sophisticated, but it's also invariant to all of these DIN transformations. What we do is something very simple. We actually just normalize the, all the filters so that you can't you know, uh, stretch everything, right? 
what ends up happening is that you, you can take all the filters of a network, multiply them by one tenth, and then right. that crams everything toward the origin, right? right? But that doesn't change the labels that the network outputs, right? You can multiply them by a million and that doesn't change the labels, right? So what ends up happening is that the landscape near the, there's a symmetry, there's a radial symmetry. The landscape near the origin is the same as the landscape further from the origin. It's just a matter of how you, of how you want to scale it, right? And so the, the metrics that we use, we just normalize all the filters to remove that invariance, right? So when you're near the origin, you've got sharp minima and you've got flat minima. When you move further from the origin, you have the exact same set of minima because of the symmetry, right? But now the, the but now everything is bigger and flatter, right? The the, vo the the volume of a flat basin is still just as many times bigger than the volume of a sharp basin, but all of those basins got bigger when you move when you move further from the uh, from the origin, right? But in the in the flat the theory literature on flat versus sharp, it's known that to get rigorous results about flat versus sharp, you have to define metrics that are invariant to that particular invariance. And that's what they do in these in these theory papers, like the the Chaudhry paper and the Zugan. And papers. these and these metrics can still be computed efficiently. Yeah, yeah. There's still metrics you can compute efficiently. You can compute entropy, but that's quite difficult. Our metric that we use. Um, so actually, we don't really define metrics of sharp and flat. We just normalize the filters and then we just visualize things so you can look and see how sharp and flat things are. So we use the eyeball norm. Now the volume metrics we use those are quantitative. But before we compute volume to compare minima, we, we, we normalize all the filters to remove the effect of this rescaling invariance. But it is still possible that I present to you two networks that are exactly the same function and yet have different volumes or let's not? See. Um, I, I think that it depends on how the networks are parameterized. So you could have two networks with two completely different architectures that right. represent the same function. Right. They would not necessarily have the same volume around the basin. Right. Um, I so, see, but not, not just with the rescaling. So you get around the rescaling trick with, with easily readjusting, but there could be more complex uh, Reparameterizations that still give you the same function that have the complex reparameterizations for sure. Um, okay. Whether or not those need to be thrown away, um, let's see. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess the, the simple answer to the question is this, yes, there could certainly be other reparameterizations. Okay, I see. But, I see. I, but just throwing away the scaling invariance is already enough to prove pack based bounds for flat minimizers, right? So I think that's a really important invariance. Um, <coughs> whether there are other important invariances, though, I can't say you're, you're certainly correct that there could be other ones. <coughs> yeah. Uh, I think we just have one last clarification question that I will ask on behalf. Uh, it is asking how many data points are you used for training and testing the float of the learning trajectory show is a good and a bad minimal? Oh, we use the whole training data set, uh, whatever the standard training data set is for the problem. So CPAR 10, we use the standard 50,000 training split. Yeah, same thing. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and I forget how many data points we okay. use for Swiss roll. There's not a standard for that. Sounds good. Okay, I think we have cleaned all the questions we got from the chat window. And due to the time limit, please, uh, I would suggest to turn the question off like communicate with Professor Goldenstein. And we need to switch to the Young's Researcher Symposium session. But before that, uh, let me express my thanks again to Professor Goldenstein. Really great talk, Tom. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Okay, so we will shift to the now, now to the last part of the workshop uh, presented by uh, eight excellent young speakers uh, that is selected uh, selected uh, to represent the diversity of the background and in the always even in the geospatial locations of the schools. So the, we will start uh, with uh, uh, Yami Benser.